I now call the member for Bennelong. When the member of Chifley is finished, may I start? The member for Bennelong has the call. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, firstly, uh, to the ladies in the room, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. May your Valentine find you. Or are you meant to find your Valentine, I think, is actually the process. Um, this is an opportunity uh, to take a step back uh, and look at things more broadly. Uh, it seems the case, to my limited experience over the last nearly three years, uh, that we are caught in day-to-day -day battle. Uh, we fight the issues of the day, uh, often politics put in front of policies. Compounded by a three-year election cycle, supercharged by a 24-hour <coughs> news cycle, a desperate government often needs to take the desperate action to serve their masters, the masters of the media. Policies that have been tried and failed, not modified, not fixed, but spun to appease and gain the pleasure of their masters in the media. During this last three years, we've had probably three major areas of conflict we have debated endlessly the state of the economy, the economy that was left in a very good state. Yes, there was a global financial crisis and there was any number of remedies. We have seen the debt escalate, the deficits that would promise to be going away, not a loss of trust and a loss of confidence. We've seen spending, we've seen waste, we've seen school halls where they weren't needed and we have seen, to compound that problem, an overspending on those school holds. We have had the issue of asylum seekers and an endless stream of boats. The previous government had put in place a raft of policies that had been developed over a period of time that had stopped the boats. And over a period of time, the experience to implement those policies to stop the boats. These policies were taken apart, some of them were brought back, but it's not unless you have the whole raft of policies and the experience to implement those policies can you effectively stop the boats. The economy was travelling well. The mining industry was thriving, and as we had it in the 50s riding on the sheep's back, we were now riding on the back of a thriving mining industry. We've had the problems of the mineral rent resource tax that has put all sorts of trauma through this mining industry. We've had promises of changing the climate and a carbon tax will do that. That alone will not change the climate. Central to these situations developing has been a loss of trust in this government a loss of trust through a loss of truthfulness, the inability to rely on what is said, a loss of certainty and a loss of stability. When you have a loss of certainty and stability, we have and have had for the first time an allegation that Australia is a nation of sovereign risk. This sovereign risk has resulted from at least three different areas of endeavour that are very important to our economy and to very important to our well-being. In the area of health, the medicines industry entered into a memorandum of understanding that would see them forego an amount of income, quite a sizeable amount of income, in return for certainty. This is telling you what international business wants. They wanted certainty. They wanted certainty that when a drug was approved by the PBAC, that it would be listed on the PBS. These drugs take up to 10 to 15 years in development and cost often over a billion dollars. The changing of rules during the playing of this game is devastating to this industry. This industry generates $4 billion of income for us each year, foreign income, and they spend approximately a billion dollars a year on research and development. And for the first time, 
when this arrangement was reneged on, the reverberations throughout the pharmaceutical world were that Australia is now a nation of sovereign risk, an uncertain place to do business, putting in peril the research and development, the investment, the continuance, and certainly any pharmaceutical industry looking to locate in Australia. We had a similar shock to our international reputation when on the strength of an ABC Four Corners story about live exports and the inhumane treatment of our cattle that was going to Indonesia, that policy was hastily put together overnight, putting politics in front of policy to appease the press, to appease certain special interest groups. But what was achieved? The international standing of Indonesia was damaged. Our relationship with Indonesia was damaged. An export industry that was generating $700 million of foreign income was reduced to close to $200 million. The biggest employer of Indigenous people in the northern part of Australia was put on its knees. There was collateral damage of enormous size. Had time been taken and better policies developed, surely there could have been a way found to have assisted Indonesia in upgrading their standards in their abattoirs, protecting our industry, enhancing our relationship with Indonesia and elevating their standing in the international community. Then we had the mining resource rent tax that put the same tremors through that industry that we are riding on so strongly, that we're relying on the biggest source of foreign income to the point that mining industries and businesses that might have committed to Australia would see that going to war-torn Africa involved less risk than doing business in Australia under this government. We have been accused time and again in this place of being the party with no ideas. Uh, at times when we have represented our policies, they say there is nothing new. And many times that is correct because we maintain our policies. They have been well thought through. They have been the result of experience of actually implementing policies in the past that have achieved the correct result. Whether it was in the stopping of the boats, the raft of policies that were put in place, the experience gained in implementing those policies to stop that. Whether it was the policies that were involved that returned our country from a $96 billion debt to surplus and credit over the period of the Howard government. And it's interesting to note the alignment between the founder of the Republican Party in the US and our own Liberal Party and the words that are attributed to Abraham Lincoln where he said, you cannot bring about prosperity by discouraging thrift. You cannot strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. You cannot help little men by tearing down big men. You cannot lift the wage earner by pulling down the wage payer. You cannot help the poor by destroying the rich. You cannot establish sound security on borrowed money. And these words <coughs> must, must be a warning to this government who have violated virtually every line of those great words and those words that are timeless, that are enduring. Uh, it might be fashionable to go into debt, but it does not have a great benefit over a long period of time. We have the experience to manage the economy, to bring this economy back into prosperity, that through work and achieving the success, we can all share in the success, not share in $900 handouts. But the question must come if you stand back far enough and look forward to the day that we are returning the budget to surplus and have paid back the debt. What do we then do? In an atmosphere where we battle each other day after day, often with arguments that don't lend any dignity to this place, we lose the opportunity to dream and to look at the potential 
that this great country has. We are squandering our time. We are squandering these opportunities. But at the time when we've stopped the boats again, returned our budgets to deficit and paid back the debt, when we've reduced taxes and business is thriving, when we've reduced red tape and small business is again thriving and able to employ people and not just generate wages for themselves but to make profits, what do we then do? It was very interesting, a little over a week ago, uh, there was a leak of a vision paper that was clearly identified, Vision 2030. Discussion paper, draft. I know very clearly that that's what the paper says because I'm on the committee that has been working on this vision. It was extraordinary that the party with no ideas, with no vision, when they come forth, albeit unwillingly at this time, with a vision paper to grow northern Australia. With a vision paper that takes advice in regard to climate change. As the southern part of the climate becomes drier and less productive, as Asia grows from 500 million to 3.5 billion over the next 20 years, the opportunity to grow our agricultural resources in the northern part of our continent, to enter into infrastructure projects that will water this area, to look at the possibility of helping those through tropical medicine research, and yes, maybe using some of our foreign aid money in a more productive way way that actually achieves real results. And so with this, this is a discussion paper and it's a vision paper, as I clearly said, I hope you're listening. That, that in coming forward with visions and the willingness to discuss visions and work through and develop policy, that in the very moment when we're being accused of being negative and having no ideas, that when the vision is put forward, albeit unwillingly, that it is the government who was so negative. It was extraordinary turn of events. But it would be certainly a hope of this place in the future, when the debt is paid back, when the boats are stopped, when business is running well, that the debate moves to what we can do with our opportunities, what we can do to fulfil our potential. What is the opportunity of a high-speed rail network? Can we stop the debate of where a second airport should be for Sydney? Because that debate should not be had until you either rule in or rule out high-speed rail. What is the purpose of high-speed rail? Is it simply to get from Melbourne to Sydney quicker or cheaper? We will not have to wait at an airport for an hour? Or is it to take the pressure off our two cities that have so overgrown their infrastructure, that suffer some of the highest land prices in the world, that suffer some of the highest levels of congestion? Is it the infrastructure that is required to provide the pressure release valve for those cities? Those cities need to be able to release land. Can you have endless urban sprawl that takes up more valuable farming area? Or could you, with the development of the cities of Goulburn, Canberra, Yass, Queen Bean, Gundagai, Albury Wodonga, and Shepparton, have a land release that could serve our purposes not just for the next 20 or 40 years, but 60 or 80 years. And as we often talk about a two-speed economy, create another speed of economy, a speed of economy that is built on housing prices that the next generation can afford, housing prices that are in the vicinity of 100 to $200,000 housing prices that would then allow lower wages and a greater opportunity for people to operate businesses. These are the debates that would dignify this place, that would lift us from what the public so often complain about, about the quality of debate, and talk about things that can be done, real things that can be done to attract investment, to grow our country and to give the next generation the opportunity of work and home ownership and a quality of life that we expect of all Australians. Hey, hey, hey.